Uh, I see Jim has written in the text that today is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo launch. Yes. Um, there was a time when governments were capable of doing big, hard things as opposed to trying to roll out a vaccine, which seems to be beyond their abilities. But don't get me, don't get me ranting about that. Okay, it's 10.02, so we probably should start. Just um, a couple, let me just uh, do something here. Just a, a couple of housekeeping announcements first. Uh, the first is if you have any questions during this, try and pop them in the chat because um, I am going to, what I will do is I'm going to turn the Zoom to uh, speaker view uh, while I'm speaking. Um, so it's easier to record it that way. And so, which, which means I might not be able to see your hands if you, if you, ra if you raise your hands. So uh, I'm now in speaker view. Um, the couple of announcements are, the first one is that these videos and, uh, and the transcripts are now, um, they're being recorded on something called, I think it's called Panopto. And we are saving them in a Blackboard. So you can find uh, any video transcripts in Blackboard. Um, so if you want to look at the video again, or you missed something, or you need your notes are unclear on some point, the videos are all there. The second housekeeping point is that we've added to Blackboard also a, an Ask Questions tab uh, that we would uh, encourage everybody to use. It's, it's set up like a kind of a social media style dialogue where you can have a chat uh, among different people and i'll be checking that regularly and i'm happy to join in the chat uh, so the idea is we get a good discussion going uh, among the students um, among the various topics and again i'll be monitor monitoring that uh, uh, frequently as well okay that's the housekeeping so this morning i wanted to follow up on what Professor Sachs talked to you about on Tuesday. Uh, and specifically, let me kind of telegraph what I want to talk about this morning. I want to do a deeper dive into Aristotle and his virtue ethics. Apologies for anybody who's taken philosophy courses. You're going to find this both repetitive and probably a little bit simplistic. But the reason I'm doing this is a lot of what we're doing in this course, Modern Economics for a Sustainable and Inclusive Planet, is based on a more Aristotelian framework than the neoclassical framework of, uh, modern, of, of the way economics is taught today. So to do that, to do that justice, we need to kind of go through the basics of what Aristotle actually taught, sorry, taught in his ethics. So we'll do that. And then I wanted to, because again, we're going to talk about a lot of the, the Catholic and the Christian tradition, I wanted to uh, also then segue into what um, the Christian tradition has to say about uh, economic justice. We'll, we'll, we'll go through the Hebrew scriptures, we'll go through Jesus, and we'll go through the church fathers. And, um, and that should, and then, and then at the end, uh, Towards the end of the class, I want to talk about uh, the switch away from this kind of um, Aristotelian Christian framework. Uh, by the way, that was really encapsulated by the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, this merging of the Christian and the Aristotelian worldviews. But in the Enlightenment, uh, and we saw some of the Enlightenment thinkers on Tuesday in Professor Sachs's course, in the Enlightenment, there was a big shift away from that framework. And I want to um, follow up on some of what Professor Sachs was, was teaching you on Tuesday in, in terms of the Enlightenment framework. Um, as for Aquinas himself, I think we're going to leave him until next week because I thought well, next week we're going to talk about a little bit of how this, how this framework differs from the rational choice framework. And I thought it would be very interesting to to show you the rational choice framework um, together with the framework of Thomas Aquinas, who really has the most sophisticated working through of this uh, alternative paradigm in terms of what does it mean to be a rational human being. 
as opposed to what neoclassical economics says about being a rational human being. So that's okay. So that's the um, that's the basics. Um, again, my chat the chat is open, so I will see any questions that pop into it. Um, let me share my screen uh, and start this PowerPoint presentation. Um, and whoops, that's not where I want to be. Where? Okay. Okay. Um, by the way, the PowerPoints will be put, will be put in the blackboard after every class. And as we said, they're also, as we come and come, I will suggest additional readings, any additional readings that, that suggested that we think you should read will also pop in, in, in the blackboard to the extent possible. Um, let me do my share screen. Okay. Okay. Everybody can see this, right? Modern Economics for a Sustainable Inclusive Planet, week one. Okay. Let's start with um, Aristotle. Aristotle uh, and his virtue ethics. So there's a number of um, major ethical theories. Those of you who have done any moral philosophy will have come across this kind of tripartite division between virtue ethics Kantian deontology and consequentialism. We're not going to worry too much about the philosophy in this course or, you know, the, that, that kind of detailed thing. But we do want to spend some time on Aristotelian virtue ethics since it, as I mentioned, it frames a lot of what uh, is going to come later. The first point to make about Aristotle is that his virtue ethics is teleological. What does that mean? That means that everything is moving towards a final cause, an end, a purpose in which a, a thing or a creature finds its perfection. So everything is moving towards this final end. Um, so you haven't, you are, you are actually as you are, and you're moving towards you what you should be if you realized your, your true nature. Now that of course can be thwarted by both impediments that are external uh, and internal. But um, when this thing or creature or a human being or whatever it is achieves their end or their purpose or what they're, what they're made to be, then that's, that's, uh, that person, thing, creature is deemed to be good of their kind, a good person or a good thing or a good animal or whatever it is. And that word good is going to be very important because um, when you see our course, we use that word a lot, you know, making good economic choices, being good citizens. And this is not a word that's used too often in neoclassical economics, because neoclassical economics is very much predicated on, on, on your own personal choices. My choice is sovereign. My, my choice is what I like. As long as it's not against the law, anything goes. But that's not the way Aristotle and, and his virtue ethics looked at it. There is a kind of a, and dare I say it, there is an objective uh, conception of the good towards which everything uh, gravitates. So what then is the, the telos, the end, the purpose, the final cause of the human being? Well, Aristotle said it's happiness. Um, now, of course, there are different views on what constitute happiness. I mean, some people can say they get happy from money, from fame, from prestige, from accomplishments, from being esteemed by people. And Aristotle recognized all that, but he nonetheless said there's a, there is a, an approach to happiness that we can all agree on. And that's called eudaimonia. Um, which literally means good spirits. Now, what is eudaimonia? eudaimonia? Eudaimonia, I think, is best translated as human flourishing, a flourishing human being, not the happiness. And we get into this much later, the distinction between that view of this view of happiness and the view of happiness that underpins the more utilitarian approach of neoclassical economics. So this approach 
to happiness basically is living in accord with what is deemed intrinsically worthwhile to human beings. Um, meaning and purpose, quality relationships, good health, the ability to make a valid contribution to society. It's desired for its own sake, not as a means to an end. Um, and Aristotle viewed this as a lifelong quest. You can't just wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to be Udemon today. I'm going to be a flourishing human being today. I feel like it. I choose it. It doesn't work that way. This takes effort. This takes hard work. And it can also, and it can be a lifelong quest to fully achieve this rounded, uh, consistent view of human flourishing. Um, okay. Now, and of course, it can be hindered by bad luck. Like you might be trying to achieve human flourishing, but you could have a, a health disaster, like a global pandemic. And that will, uh, that, will, that will hurt you. You could be living in poverty and that will hurt you. So if you're perceptive, you can, you can kind of be thinking ahead towards where we're going in this course. You know, if, if we think that human flourishing is the goal of human beings inherent in their human nature, then if you're living in poverty or, you're, or deprivation or you don't have health or education or food or shelter or clothing or you can't afford the basics of a dignified life, then you're going to be blocked from achieving your eudaimonia. So you can see immediately where we're going with this. Uh, in terms of our, our modern economics course. We're not doing this just um, because it's fun to explore ancient ethical theories, but because it's very relevant for modern economic thought. Okay, so I mentioned that, you know, um, every creature or thing or person uh, is deemed good of that thing uh, when, they, um, when they actualize their potentials. So what distinguishes human beings from everybody else, everything else? Aristotle, and this is absolutely central, said the capacity for reason. You know, we share, we can divide the soul into the appetite, appetitive part, the part that we share with animals, you know, our, you know, our desires. And then we have the rational part of the soul, which is through the use of reason which is only, um, only uh, constitutive of human beings, no other, no other creatures. So by Aristotle's virtue ethics, a good human, a good human is one who uses reason well and puts the rational soul in the driver's seat. How do you do that? And this gets in, there's a number of chains, there's a number of links in this chain. And the next link in the chain is, how do you do that? How do you exercise your capacity for reason to, to achieve eudaimonia? And the answer is by exercising the virtues, by exercising the virtues in accordance with excellence. This is why it's called virtue ethics. Now, what are virtues? We have to immediately strip away any, um, any common understanding we might have of virtues. Like some people think of virtue as a very stuffy 1950s style morality. Uh, that, that is, take that out of your mind. That is not what Aristotle meant by virtue. For, for ver, by Aristotle meant by virtue, you know, if you, the qualities um, to put the possession of which allows you to achieve your purpose and the lack of those qualities mean you're frustrated in achieving your purpose. So you have to find what those qualities are and to basically deploy them. So in that sense, a virtue is an excellence. You take a latent capacity and you bring it to full potential. That's very important. You take a latent sorry, capacity and you bring it to full potential. You exercise the virtues in line with excellence. One simple way of, of putting it is you become the best version of yourself. Um, you become as, and I like, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who in 1981 wrote a book called After Virtue, which was really about the need to go back to Aristotle and have a more Aristotelian framework for 
uh, for looking at modern ethics. And we, I'll talk more about what that means later on. He said, you move from who you are as a human being to who you could be and should be if you realized your, your perfection. Now, note what that means uh, in terms of the good. You know, um, if you're a, a good human being is one that be, is a virtuous human being. You're living a life of reason and virtue. You take an excellence, you take a latent capacity and you bring it to full potential. But there is a, there is a notion of the good built into that. Like, for, let's say that you have a great talent for fraud, for ripping people off. Should you take that talent and bring it to full potential? Absolutely not, right? That is not a good, that's a, that will be considered bad, not good. So there are choices that you make for the good. And Aristotle would argue that your human nature is oriented towards the good. If you're, do, if you're becoming a con man or something like that, you are not deploying the virtues in accord with excellence. You're actually inhibiting them because you're not being a good human being. Now, the next link in the chain is Aristotle argued that there are differences between intellectual and moral virtues. Uh, now, the frustrating part about Aristotle is he never gave a full list of what the virtues are. He just gave examples of them. And the idea was you could find more if you thought through them. And, and honestly, some of the virtues Aristotle some of the things Aristotle thought were virtues are kind of funny to us today in the 21st century, because this is three, 2,300 years old. This is from an ancient Greek city state. But some of the intellectual virtues are things like practical wisdom. Hold on to that thought. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, knowledge, good judgment. Uh, the moral virtues are things like courage, justice, generosity, friendliness, temperance, self-respect. Uh, so you can see where we're going here and you can see we can easily add uh, different kinds of virtues uh, if, we, um, if, if we think them through. And when we get to Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas hones in on basically four cardinal virtues and three theological virtues as, as fundamental. Um, now, I think the most important one here is what Aristotle deems practical wisdom or phronesis, phronesis, P-H-R-O-N-E-S-I-S. -E and that basically means deploying reason to figure out the best means of achieving our ends in any given circumstance. So it's using your reason to figure out how you achieve eudaimonia in the specific circumstances of your daily life. So that, how do you do that? That requires thoughtful, reflective deliberation. It requires listening to and learning from teachers and role models. This is very important in virtue ethics. Now, phronesis is an intellectual virtue, but Aristotle argued that it's needed for the exercise of the moral virtues. If you want to be a just and courageous person, you need to exercise practical wisdom to get there. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about practical wisdom, especially next week, when we argue that it is a, we distinguish practical wisdom from the, rush, from the kind of rationality that is kind of inherent in modern neoclassical economics, which is a very, very different view of rationality. Um, but we think that this idea of phronesis this using the reason to figure out what it means to be a good human being, including in economic life, is very, very central. Okay, the next link in the chain is what Aristotle called the golden mean. Now, the golden mean, Aristotle thought that every virtue sits as a mean between two vices. And you can figure out your virtues if you look at the two vices sitting on the opposite side. Now, this, you know, central to Aristotle's thought is the idea of balance, moderation, and harmony. Too much or too little of a thing is usually not good. It's usually a vice. So, for example, if you take the virtue of courage, on one side would sit cowardice. 
on the other side would sit rashness. So courage is kind of the golden mean between cowardice and rashness. What about justice? Well, on one side, you would have discrimination. Um, on the other side, you would have favoritism. So again, justice is the golden mean between those two. Likewise, you could say generosity is the golden mean between, um, between profligacy, um, spending all your money, and being a miser. Uh, again, you're supposed to live the balanced life. And by the way, it's, fun it's funny because you know, Aristotle was writing during this axial age when you had a lot of great thinkers like Buddha and Confucius uh, developing their thoughts. And you know, Buddha also thought that, um, that uh, the, the human life should be balanced uh, between, uh, the, between extremes. So it's a very interesting overlap there, writing at more or less the same time, but obviously separated by, by geography and culture. So a virtuous person then, according to Aristotle, knows what is right, does what is right, and for the right reasons. Now, a lot of ethics is, is rule-based. You know, think of the Ten Commandments. You follow the rules, you're, you're a good human being. That's really not Aristotelian virtue ethics. For Aristotle, moral reasoning always depends on the context, on the circumstance. You figure out the best course of action in the circumstance that faces you. It's not about following rules. Um, in that sense, virtues are like muscles. The more you use them, the better they get. They get better with practice. You build in the muscle memory. So when you face new circumstances, you know how to face them properly, deploying uh, your reason and living a life of virtue. So virtues, importantly, are not a means to an end. You don't say, I want to be virtuous solely so I can achieve eudaim eudaimonia. That's my end. No, virtues are their own reward. Um, you become a virtuous person because you choose to be virtuous. And by choosing to be virtuous, you achieve human flourishing. You achieve eudaimonia. Okay, very, imp very important. So that is the basics of Aristotelian um, virtue ethics, especially as laid down in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, uh, as Professor Sachs says, probably his favorite book um, of all time. Um, and there's a companion version, and we dropped a couple of chapters of this into the blackboard called The Politics, when Aristotle talks about, okay, what does all of this mean for our common life together in politics? And remember, he was talking about the Athenian city-state. He wasn't talking about the large, complicated bureaucratic societies we have today, which somewhat makes complicates what he has to say and sometimes might make him sound a little naive. But naive or not, I think there's a lot of what he teaches us from across the centuries that remains highly uh, relevant for us. So the key here is that Aristotle argued that we are social animals or political animals, zoon politikon, uh, because happiness always has a social dimension. Aristotle says, you can't really be happy without friends. And, you know, I think when you think about that, the last year of the pandemic has really, for, for a lot of us, has brought this home. How many of us have been deeply unhappy because we're locked down and can't spend valuable time with our friends and our quality relationships? I've certainly felt that, uh, not being able to see friends. And I think um, most, all, I would say all of us here have probably had similar feelings. And I think that tells us that Aristotle was really onto something, that we are social animals. And when we, we will talk later about some of the modern psychological and scientific evidence about that, that we, you know, we are indeed social animals. Aristotle got that right. Um, so if we're social animals, what we seek in our common life together is the common good. And it's, it's not just the good life, the eudaimonia for yourself, 
but the good life with others. So not just the good life for yourself, the good life with others. So what is the common good? I think the common good, and this, by the way, is going to be a central concept of Catholic social teaching uh, when we get there, but it is prefigured in Aristotle. So the common good, uh, the way I'm going to define it, is the good arising from a shared social life that transcends the good of the individuals participating in it and is simply not divisible into the sum of these individual parts. I think two classic examples of, a, of common goods would be marriage and friendship. In marriage and friendship, you have two people or more people joining together and the good that they get transcends the good of the individual and you can't just break it down into the sum of individual goods. It's a greater good. Um, Aristotle argued and Catholic social teaching continues to argue that that idea of a common good can be extended to the political and to the economic life. What is politics for Aristotle? Politics for Aristotle is, surprise, surprise, it's about forming good citizens and cultivating good character. So the leaders, political leaders, should be those who best excel in civic virtue and who are best at deliberating for the common good. Now, does that sound naive today? Maybe a little bit. But remember, Aristotle was talking about the Athenian democracy, the democracy of a small city-state where a group of men, and yes, by the way, they were all men. Aristotle was not big on the dignity of women. He also thought slavery was justified in some cases. So we know when we, when we deploy Aristotle's reasoning, we also realize that he had some pretty horrific views on a number of subjects that we just cannot paper over. But, but for the common good in politics, you need, he argued that through a kind of, through this kind of social cooperation, we can work out a shared understanding of what constitutes a good and dignified life for all. And this deliberation on the common good by virtuous leaders increases virtue in society generally. Um, so that's the politics uh, for Aristotle. Now, when we, come to, when we come to people like Thomas Hobbes, that is like uh, 180 degrees opposite from what they argued, but hold, hold that thought uh, for, for a little bit right now. The last thing I want to talk about on Aristotelian virtue ethics is the role of wealth in the economics. And I've written it in here as oikonom oikonomia versus krematistica. Um, by the way, I got this distinction from uh, one of your professors at Gebelli, Professor Michael Pearson, who has written a very, very nice paper on this about Arist Aristotle's insights in business ethics. And uh, I think I might actually drop that on the blackboard because it's a very nice paper. It's a paper by Michael Pearson and his co-author, Klaus Dierksmeier. And, uh, and it's about this distinction between oikonomia, which is economics, and krematistica, which I'll define. Now, oikonomia, economics, is de derived from two Greek words, oikos and nomos, um, which is usually translated as household management, managing management of the household, which is a fine definition. But I think it's, uh, it can be a little superficial relative to what Aristotle was actually trying to get at. So remember, for Aristotle, economics is always at the service of ethics. Ethics comes first, and economics is a sub-branch of ethics. And by the way, that distinction goes all the way, that, 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 that um, goes all the way through to Adam Smith. Adam Smith was not a professor of economics. Adam Smith was a professor of moral philosophy, and that turns out to be very important for what Adam Smith was teaching. So, you know, historically, economics has always been seen as a sub-branch of ethics, that has broken down in the last couple of centuries with the rise of neoclassical economics. I would argue that that's a detrimental development and that we need to restore uh, an economics centered on ethics. So in this sense, economics for Aristotle is really about the ethical rules for managing the household. And the household is both public and private. So it's the private household 
but it's also the public household, the government, the state, but it's the ethical rules for managing uh, this household. Now, crematistica, on the other hand, is the pursuit of wealth for its own sake, divorced from any concept of good, whether individual good or, or common good. And Aristotle argued that crematistica is corrupting. If you pursue wealth for its own sake, divorced from the common good, it's corrupting. It undermines virtue. It promotes a false view of happiness, which is not eudaimonia, and it corrupts business practice. It, it leads you, you're more inclined to be fraudulent and to cheat and to cut corners uh, if you are out for wealth for its own sake. Now, does this sound familiar to you? I think a lot of modern financial practice is more crematistica than oikonomia. And because we have ingrained this view that the goal of economics is to maximize wealth or maximize profits rather than to achieve human flourishing. So you can see immediately, depending on what your purpose is, your final goal, you can achieve, you can reach very different uh, kind of outcomes. Um, So wealth for Aristotle is never an end in itself, but it is a means to achieving the good life. So he called for wealth so that people could live, and the, 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 the way he phrased it is temperately but liberally. Because if you separate temperance from liberality, liberality leads to luxury and temperance leads to toil. So again, it's this idea of balance and moderation on the golden meal a golden mean, sorry. So you don't want to live, luxury is corrupting, but toil is also bad. It, 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 poverty and toil are bad, but living, but like wallowing in wealth is also bad. You want a good balance and, and uh, balance and self-moderation. Okay. So pursuing, to sum up, pursuing wealth for its own sake undermines virtue and the common good. It doesn't make us happy it enslaves us, it corrupts us, and it corrupts the intrinsic rewards of good workmanship, uh, the way Aristotle uh, put it. So that's, in a nutshell, um, the, uh, the Aristotelian virtue ethics. Let me pause there for a second and see if there are, because I can't see, I need to be able to see the, sorry, the, um, uh, nope. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the zoom. Where's the zoom? There's the zoom. Sorry. Let me put that down there. Let me, let me. Okay. I, I just feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not able to see, I'm not able to see the, uh, the zoom right now. So if anybody has a question, can you just speak it so I can hear you? Because I can't see for some reason, I'm not able to see the, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the chat box, uh, I have, you know. Um, Tony, you just need to stop uh, sharing the, the, like on the, on the top, there's a green. Oh yeah. I do stop. Yes. I do stop share. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. There we go. Okay. So I've stopped sharing my screen. So now I can see the chat. So nobody has any questions right now. So everybody knows Aristotle inside out. Very good. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's continue then. I will start sharing my screen again. Thank you for that advice, by the way. Now I, you know, one thing you learn about me is that I'm not very technically savvy. So this is all new for me and it's, it's hard for me, but I'm getting the hang of it. Um, all right, so let's share the screen again. All right, and we go back, we will go back to the PowerPoint. And we'll now, now let's talk about the second tradition uh, that underlines our kind of moral economics. And that is the Christian tradition. Um, this is a separate tradition from Aristotle, which you will find surprisingly, or maybe not too surprisingly, there are significant overlaps between how the, the Judeo-Christian tradition 
uh, viewed uh, economics and pursuit of wealth and how Aristotle looked at it. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the Hebrew script. So I'm going to just to telegraph where I'm going. I'm going to do Hebrew scriptures, Jesus, and then the early church. And I'm just keeping an eye on the clock because I don't want to run over with this class. Um, the first point to understand that is Judaism was born out of the historical experience of, marginaliz of marginalization and vulnerability. So the exodus from Egypt was, a, was, is, it was and is the defining uh, event in Jewish history. And no phrase is more recurrent in the Hebrew scripture than a reminder that the Jewish people were once slaves in the land of Egypt. This is repeated 36 times. And it gives rise to a moral obligation to love, respect, and care for the poor and the excluded. Um, the terms used in the scriptures are usually widows, orphans, and resident aliens or foreigners. And we should, we should view that as that's the poor of, of, the, of their day. This is a very agrarian society, um, centuries before Christ, a very simple agrarian society, and the poor were those who didn't have any kind of social support uh, for them. Now, there were a lot of injunctions to care for the poor, a lot of very strict rules laid down, which are still strict for us today. For example, um, when you're harvesting your fields, you were told to keep the corners of your field unharvested because that's for the poor. When you're harvesting your vineyards, you're told not to return a second time to pick up grapes that weren't mature enough the first time because they're for the poor. You're told not to charge interest on loans, uh, no usury, because one way to really exploit the poor, especially if you, if you think of an agrarian society where crop failures and droughts are common um, and farmers to survive need to take out loans, one way to ruin a farmer and to ruin their life is to charge interest on those loans. Uh, and to, that's really, so the, the Hebrew scriptures argue that charging interest on those loans is really exploiting the poor and is basically banned. Uh, and you're supposed to treat migrants and uh, immigrants um, well, treat them as if they were from your own people because you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, so I think some of the most radical um, analysis or rules from the Hebrew scriptures come in these cycles of seven. So seven days, seven years, uh, seven cycles of seven, 49 years. And uh, obviously every seventh day is the Sabbath when you rest, you don't work. You're supposed to take that day off. Everybody knows what that means because that, uh, that has become part of our culture, thankfully. Um, the sabbatical is every seventh year. Uh, every seventh year, you're supposed to leave your fields untilled for the poor. You're supposed to forgive all debts and release all those who sold themselves into slavery because of their debts. Again, this was a common occurrence in the ancient Near East, especially in response to drought and crop failures. People would sell themselves into debt. These prisoners were to be released. Now, that's the sabbatical, which is supposed to be every seven years. Every 49 years or 50 years is the jubilee. So the jubilee is a sabbatical year with an added kick. And that added kick is any land or crop rights that were sold under distress or pledged to creditors in the last 50 years were to be returned to their original owners. So again, remember, land forfeitures were very common in the, in the ancient Near East, again, in response to things like droughts and crop failures. Um, you often were forced off your land. Well, this was supposed to be a time when you, you got your land back. And the idea there is because the land belongs to God and we human beings are just tenants. So there's no, there's no sense of absolute property ownership. And again, if you're perceptive, you'll realize that that's a very different view of property than we operate under today. Now, there's a fascinating 
book I read recently called by called Mike by a guy called Michael Hudson called and forgive them their debts. I didn't put this in the readings because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, it goes into too much detail on a on a topic that's not one hundred percent central. But it's fat. But those of you who are interested in it, it's absolutely fascinating. And he argues that in the in the Bronze Age. There was when a new ruler ascended to the throne, say in ancient Mesopotamia, they brought in clean slates and a clean slate was you canceled all agrarian debts, you liberated those in debt bondage and you reversed land forfeitures. So cancel debts, liberate those in bondage and reverse land forfeitures. And the idea there is, and this was not just altruism, this is very much self-interest. Hudson argues that this is how you maintain social stability. This is how you maintain your, your agrarian tax base. This is how you maintain a workforce to build your temple complexes and things like that. Because otherwise, you will have creditor monopolies seizing all the land. You will have homeless tenants. You will have social instability. You will have violence. So the idea is, as a new ruler ascended the throne, they would introduced this clean slate legislation. And uh, Hudson actually argues that the Statue of Liberty, which you can see in New York, when you raise the torch is actually the ancient symbol for this free liberation from debt. So that's uh, next time you look at the Statue of Liberty, you can look at it in a, in a slightly different light. Um, what the Jubilee did was make this regular. It took that ancient Bronze Age practice of clean slates and made it regular every 15 years. Uh, again, it's an absolutely fascinating book. He's done a ton of historical research. Those of you who are interested in history, as I am, will, will really get a lot out of it. Um, okay, that's the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures. Uh, the Hebrew prophets. So as the ancient, he, as ancient Israel was getting more wealthy, you had something that Aristotle would have recognized. You had the pursuit of wealth and the mistreatment of the poor. And the prophets were basically very angry about this. If you look at some of the prophets, it's God protects and prioritizes the poor, especially the orphan, the widow, the foreigner, and promising to rain down punishment on those who oppress them. The second point is that worship and fasting are hollow gestures if you're going to mistreat the poor. The prophet said, I don't want your worship. I don't want your fasting if you're going to mistreat the poor. That's the key power part of justice. Now, in the time of rising prosperity, the prophets argued that corruption was coming from the zealous pursuit of wealth. Greed and self-interest lie behind injustice. And injustice is not just a moral failure but as a plague that could destroy society from within. Again, something that Hudson and his clean slate legislation uh, in ancient Mesopotamia would have, would have recognized. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. You can see very, you can just see a few examples of, and I won't read through this. Um, this will be, um, you know, let me just, uh, I see this, for they hand over the just for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the destitute into dust of the earth and force the lowly out of the way. That's Amos. Um, again, here I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no pleasure in your solemnities. Blah, blah, blah. Rather let justice surge like waters and righteousness like an unfolding stream. Um, it's no coincidence, by the way, that Martin Luther King um, used a lot of the language from these, uh, the, from the, the, the justice language from the Hebrew scriptures. And Amos is certainly one of the, one of the, uh, the most uh, outspoken of them all, which you also have, whoops. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, there's also Isaiah, which I will skip over because I, oh, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, there's also care for the earth as well as the poor. The idea that, you know, God's creation is good. Everything that God created is good. And therefore we need to care for the earth. 
So, and this, by the way, is a major theme of Pope Francis's encyclical called Laudato Si, which we will talk about later in the course when we talk about climate change and environmental sustainability. But for now, the Hebrew scriptures are replete with examples with, with, with an injunction to properly steward nature. We're called to till and to keep, but don't till too much and keep too little. Uh, have proper stewardship uh, of nature. Um, and there are three core relationships, Pope Francis says, uh, in this context, with God, with our fellow human beings, and with the earth, with the earth itself. And when you break one of these relationships, you break all of these relationships. Um, I think a very interesting insight is from the story of Cain and Abel at the very beginning of the Hebrew scriptures, when Cain kills his brother Abel. Well, he has therefore broken his relationships. He's broken his relationships with his fellow human being, with his brother, but he's also broken his relationship with God because God punishes and exiles him. And he's broken his relationship with the earth because he's exiled and forced to do toil and hard labor for the rest of his life. The earth is no longer bountiful for him. Um, so again, care for the earth uh, goes all the way back to the very ancient Hebrew scriptures. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus' mission, again, I, I, I want to talk about what Jesus talks about from the context of the Hebrew scripture, from, from, from with the context of, um, of economic justice. Jesus' mission, in Luke's gospel, the first words Jesus said were, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Now, if that reminds you of what I was just talking about, the Jubilee year, freedom from debts, it should, because that was what Jesus' hearers would have heard when they heard that passage that it's liberation from crippling economic injustice. Um, and Jesus preached the kingdom of God, which is the transformation of the world, the bending of history towards justice through the active power of God. He taught in total 30, here's a inter, inter, very interesting statistic. He taught 31 parables. 19 of those 31 parables refer to themes of indebtedness, social class, the misuse of wealth, a bad distribution of wealth and worker pay. So 19 of them refer to economic themes. And I think at that time, the poor were crippled by high taxes, both locally and by the Romans. And they were frequently reduced to the status of indentured term, uh, sorry, of indentured servants. So it was a very tough time for the poor and Jesus' teaching should be seen in the context of that. Um, there's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and that's basically when Jesus, when Jesus talks about a rich man who dies and is sent to hell because Lazarus was outside his gate, uh, covered in sores, living in extreme poverty, and the rich man just feasted uh, on his uh, wealth and uh, on his riches and ignored the suffering of Lazarus. And... Um, he repents it in the afterlife, and God basically says to him, sorry, you had, uh, you had the teachings of the scriptures about how you're supposed to treat the poor, and you ignored Lazarus. So Lazarus will find uh, happiness, and you will not in the afterlife. That's, um, and that's how Jesus says we are going to be judged. We're going to be judged on how we treat the poor, the least among us. So when Jesus said in the Beat, sorry, in the um, in the he said, you know Matthew twenty five in judgment, uh, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. And th those who are judged um, to have an eternal reward are saying. Lord, when did we see you in all these circumstances? I don't remember. 
And Jesus said, whenever you did this to the least among us, you did it to me. And then he turns to the damned and he says the opposite. I was hungry. You gave me nothing. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing. I was a stranger. You kicked me out. I was sick and you ignored me. All this stuff. He says, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did to me. Um, likewise, with the Beatitudes, Jesus said, you know, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed for you know, all this stuff. And then woe to those who are full, who are rich, uh, who laugh, because God's intervention is about to take place, and the poor are going to be relieved. The poor are going to, achieve, going to get their justice. Um, there's also Jesus and the rich man and wealth. When the rich man says, you know, what should I do? What, what, what you, what you, what's your advice to me? And Jesus said, well, you cannot serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is wealth. Mammon is an idol. It's the antithesis of everything about the nature of God. Um, my, my friend, Father Dan Grudy of Notre Dame calls it money theism, which I think is a very, very, very nice term. Um, and the final, and I, I'm rushing a little through this because I'm realizing I'm, I'm behind time, but um, who is my neighbor? You know the story of the Good Samaritan? Everybody knows that. I don't need to repeat it, that the person who looks after the, 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 the guy who's beaten by robbers and left at the side of the road is from the despised community of Samaritans and not, the, not his, fellow, uh, his fellow Jews. And the, the logic there is that every single person is our neighbor. Um, what, um, when, I, when I took part in the Ethics in Action initiative at the Vatican, um, the great Orthodox theologian, Metropolitan John Zizioulis, referred to this as infinite relationality. He said, Christianity is about infinite relationality. And that kind of blew my mind uh, when you think about the implications of that, that you know, our sense of relationship goes way beyond what Aristotle taught. Aristotle thought that we are social animals in the context of your little city state. You're, you're, you're not related to people in Sparta. You're, only, you're, you're in Athens, you're not in Sparta. But for Christianity, this encompasses everybody in the world. Uh, everybody in the world is your, is your brother and sister. And that has profound implications when we come to economic justice on the global scale. When we talk about questions of global poverty and global inequality, uh, this will become very, very important. All right, let me move on to the next small point, which is the church fathers. The church fathers were the early, the theologians of the early church in the kind of late Roman Empire as they were developing the Christian faith. And they had some very strong uh, thoughts on, on these themes, on how, you know, a Christian was supposed to deal with wealth uh, and money. And I think there are five main points that I'll just talk about. You know, only God satisfies your deepest yearnings. So if you look to things like wealth and possessions and status, you're only going to be unhappy and you're going to have a chaotic life. Again, what does that remind you of? Aristotle, right? Aristotle said the exact same thing. That um, Aristotle said eudaimonia. He didn't talk about God. But he did say that wealth, possessions, and status is illusory wealth. It's not, it's, sorry, is illusory happiness. It doesn't bring real happiness. It brings a kind of a, uh, an elusive form of happiness that doesn't hold. Second point, all human beings share a common bond and all have equal dignity because we are all created equally uh, under God. We are all interconnected uh, and therefore we social and economic distinctions to mean nothing to God. This gives rise to a third point, is that the goods of the earth are destined for all. Um, this is a very, very provocative and radical view of the role of private property. I'll talk more about it when I talk about the themes of Catholic social teaching in week three. It's called the universal destination of goods. Professor Sachs hinted at it on Tuesday. This is not so much a condemnation of private 
ownership of private property, but it's a condemnation of hoarding wealth when there's so much poverty and deprivation in your midst. So if you have more than you need, you're obliged to share your surplus with the poor because God gave you your wealth to, to relieve the poor. That's basically a teaching of the church fathers. Point four is that God is close to the poor and treasures them. This is called in modern Catholic social thought, the preferential option for the poor. Um, and then point five, again, echoing Aristotle, an attachment to wealth can corrupt the stole, soul. Sorry, This corruption manifests in the stain for the poor and it makes you blind to the plight of the poor and the suffering and the needs of others. And it follows that a simple life free from luxury can actually be quite liberating. Um, let me see how much, let me give you a couple of, uh, of quotes because just, just to show you how radical some of these teachings should be. And by the way, I should say that um, most of what I'm saying, most of what I'm talking about in this lecture can be found in, in, the, in my chapter one of Cathonomics, uh, my book, my book chapter, which is in uh, the Dropbox. So don't worry if I'm going too fast. You can, I would recommend you read that. And this is all in there. Um, Saint, this is St. Basil. He says, when someone steals another's clothes, we call them a thief. Shall we not give the same name to one who does not clothe the naked and does not? The bread in your cupboard belongs to the hungry. The coat unused in your closet belongs to the one who needs it. The shoes rotting in your closet belong to the one who has no shoes. The money which you hoard up belongs to the poor. Uh, if you quote St. Basil today, people will call you a communist, I'm pretty sure. Um, likewise, St. Ambrose, he said, you are not making a gift of what is yours to the poor man, but you are giving him back what is his. You have been appropriating things that are meant for the common use of everyone, the earth belongs to everyone, not to the rich. And uh, St. John Chrysostom, I'll let you read that yourself. Because uh, I read, not to share our wealth with the poor is theft from the poor and deprivation of their means of life. We do not possess our wealth, but theirs. So there's a moral obligation to share with the poor. Uh, this is just an example of Theodoret of Cyrus, who's one of the church fathers, a lesser known figure. But, uh, you know, he talks about like what a, how you can be corrupted by wealth. Wicked men become supercilious and puffed up, strutting through the marketplace on horseback or in carriages, despising others. You know, uh, you can you can read that uh, yourself. Uh, but I just think uh, so the church fathers, very radical. And by the way, this radical some of these radical teachings didn't really last because as the church as the church got richer and more rich people joined the church, um, the condemnation of wealth and the rich became a little more muted and the emphasis switched instead towards endowing the church itself, like using your wealth to uh, build churches and monasteries and so to indirectly help the poor that way. Um, okay, very good. Where are we now? We're at 11. We're doing fine. Now, as I said, I'm glad I left Thomas Aquinas to next week because I don't have time to just do justice to Thomas Aquinas because there's a lot to talk about there. But we will come back to that next week. For now, let's jump ahead. Let's jump ahead in time. I want to, for my last 15 minutes, I want to talk about some of the stuff that Professor Sachs talked about uh, on Tuesday to go a little bit deeper into it. Um, so we have this framework that comes to us from Aristotle, that comes to us from the Judeo-Christian teachings, centered on the common good, centered on the well-being of all, centered on human flourishing. Um, and then we have this, the Enlightenment paradigm, uh, which developed in the Starting in the sixteenth, uh, start, starting in the seventeenth century, uh, with people like uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, um, and goes on to the present day. And I would argue that there are um, three core shifts, three big shifts. And the way, the, and the reason why I'm doing this is to show you that 
these three shifts can really go a long way to explaining why neoclassical economics is what it is today, where it came from. And shift number one, you move from the common good to the autonomous individual. Uh, and the implication there is we are no longer social animals bound to each other by friendship. We are just autonomous individuals and therefore the state is simply a social contract uh, between free consenting autonomous individuals. This is the view of Thomas Hobbes. This is the view of John Locke, but it's not the view of Aristotle. The view of Aristotle is uh, the state is not a social contract. It's a natural entity because as, as, as political animals, uh, we naturally form governments uh, as part of our human nature. The second shift is again, and you saw this with the Aristotelian tradition and the Christian tradition, a shift from balance and moderation towards mastery and maximization. Uh, the technical term they say is there's no longer an acquisitive ceiling. Uh, you, want, you want as much as you can get and you're only constrained by your income or what other people have that you don't have, but you, your, desi your, your desires are unlimited. And this goes into how we treat nature. Uh, there was the view that you, use, you can use science to gain control over the natural world, um, what Rene Descartes called uh, mastery and possession of the natural world. And that leads to the idea of, of, of unlimited economic growth, uh, which has, been, has, has such uh, uh, negative consequences on our environment, on our natural world. The third shift, which is really related to the second, is, that this, is the, the link between private vice and public virtue. The idea is that things that used to be called vices in the tradition of Aristotle, in the tradition of, Christi of Judeo-Christianity, suddenly become virtues in the sense that they lead to good social outcomes. So we seek power, profit, and pleasure without limit and without end. And this seeking of power, profit, and pleasure without limit and without end can lead to good social outcomes. Uh, here I would refer you to the chapter by David Wooten. Uh, his book is called Power, Profit, and Pleasure. It's in the Dropbox, uh, the first chapter definitely worth reading because it explains very well this uh, enlightenment uh, concept. Now, there are political changes. I want to talk about three figures very quickly. So Machiavelli is the first one. He argues that you dump virtue for power. So leaders should be tough and not merciful. Um, and why? Because that leads not only to glory of the leader, which he saw as good, but as to good social outcomes. So peace and harmony. So Machiavelli, uh, first thinker that says what, we used to, what used to be called vices can actually be virtuous because they lead to good social outcomes. Then you get the Thomas Hobbes, which Jeff talked about. And we have uh, his chapter 13 from the Leviathan in the Dropbox is worth reading because it's a very short read and it's a pretty easy read. Uh, Hobbes is, is, is one of the quintessential thinkers arguing that we have these insatiable appetites, appetites for power and pleasure. And because we all, we all act in the same way, that results in a war of all against all. And so that's a pretty miserable outcome, a life that is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. How do you avoid that? The only way you can avoid that is to cede your power to an all-powerful sovereign, the Leviathan. It's a very dark view of human nature. Uh, he hated Aristotle. He thought Aristotle was ridiculously uh, optimistic in his views of human nature. Um, but Hobbes was writing during the middle of the English Civil War, a very, uh, a very bad, uh, disruptive time. And uh, so that, that context, I think, is important. Um, but again, you know, it's the social, the state is a social contract. You cede your power to this all powerful sovereign. Uh, in a couple of weeks, Professor Sachs will talk more about John Locke. So I won't talk about John Locke here, but John Locke also had an idea. It's a less, it's a much brighter idea, less dark, but society is also a social contract. 
and he had views of property which leaned kind of libertarian. But again, that's for week three when we talk about views of property. The third thinker here is David Hume. Um, now he argued against Aristotle. You remember Aristotle, he argued that reason is the slave to the passions. In other words, your, moral, your morality is driven not by reason, but by your emotions, but by your passions, by your feelings. And you use, reason tells us how to get what we desire. Um, now, this is called non-cognitive ethics, and it's, it's, it's very, very big today, uh, the idea that, and, it's, and there's something to it. If you look at psychology, if you look at psychology, uh, if you look at neuroscience, a lot, of the, a lot of the modern scientific evidence does say that we are heavily influenced by emotions, by our feelings. Um, of course, none of this was new. None of this would surprise Aristotle. Aristotle simply thought that we should have, we should allow reason to conquer these, um, these appetites, these passions. But Hume said no. Um, but of course, the problem with that is it can lead to how do you know what's a good passion or a bad passion? So Hume distinguished between good passions or calm passions and bad passions or violent passions. And he felt that people were pretty much alike. He called it a stable and general perspective. So we all kind of like the same things and we dislike the same things. And that gives you a, a sense of morality. And um, the problem arises, well, what happens if we're not all alike? And this, gives, this can easily give rise to a philosophical position called emotivism. Emotivism is the view that all moral um, decisions are simply tastes and preferences. So I like chocolate ice cream, you like strawberry ice cream. I support the death penalty, you hate the death penalty, but it's just a preference, it's just a view. Um, it's no different from a preference for your flavor of ice cream. Now that can be obviously, that can obviously lead to a very, very um, risky moral ground and Alistair McIntyre, a philosopher I mentioned earlier, who wrote after virtue, uh, who argued that we need to kind of rediscover the Aristotelian roots of ethics. He argued that much of modern philosophy, much of modern moral philosophy is emotivism, that it's really based on the view that um, morality is all, is all about subjective preferences. And the reason I talk about that here is that certainly informs modern economics because modern economics is very much of the view that your preferences are your preferences and should not be criticized. Um, yeah, what you like is what you like. And we'll talk about that as we go along in the course. Uh, but that can be traced to this kind of emotivism, emotivistic view. So this is kind of the political realm. Um, I'm going to move quickly now because we only have five minutes left. Uh, this repeats something that Professor Sachs talked about. You know, Bernard Mandeville, he wrote a, a, a track called The Fable of the Bees, and this is a, a, an excerpt from it. He basically said that you have a hive of bees, it's a fable, and they're driven by selfishness, by competition, by pride, by the love of luxury, and by even by fraud. And they're very successful. It's a really successful hive of bees because of that. Then he said, what would happen if they became honest and virtuous? He said the hive would collapse and stronger enemies would attack it. You see, every part was full of vice, yet the whole mass of paradise and go down. Happy, by, made friends with vice. And ever since the worst of the multitude did something for the common good, that view of the common good is pretty much the opposite of how Aristotle viewed the common good. So virtue, it, it, vice becomes virtue because, you know, all that stuff, which would have been traditionally called vice, uh, it can actually lead to good social outcomes. Uh, and a lot of modern economics would argue that selfishness leads to um, economic uh, wealth, creation of wealth. That brings us to our final thinker today, which is Adam Smith. And Adam Smith argued that in the wealth of nations, 
it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect their dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Self-interest is what drives us. Self-love is what drives people. Not um, No, but Adam Smith, as I mentioned earlier, was a much more complicated thinker than that. He was not Bernard Mandeville. Actually, he hated Bernard Mandeville's thinking. He thought that he was appalled by the idea that fraud could be justified, for example. Um, he was actually a professor of moral philosophy. And as well as the wealth of nations from which this quote is taken, he wrote another book, a book he regarded himself as more important, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in that book, he talked about morality. He said, however selfish, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So he is saying we derive pleasure, happiness from seeing the happiness of other people. And in turn, he argued that we get a good reputation by being good people. Um, and this is, you know, it's a very Humean approach, uh, which for reasons we don't need to get into, it's a very Humean uh, non-cognitive approach to morality. But he very much, but it, it seems in a sense, some people have called, have talked about this as the two Adam Smiths. You know, Adam Smith one is self-interest, self-love. You're out for yourself and you, you create wealth um, through, you know, through the division of labor and through competition uh, and through self-interest, um, you get wealth and prosperity. But here he's talking about empathy and benevolence. Um, and so this also, uh, from a point of view of Smith, underpins economic transactions. So Smith is a very complicated thinker. And we'll, we, we, we get into it later in the course, we get into this uh, in terms of the power of uh, the importance of reputation and what reputation means and what that means for Smith. But the point to take away here is that Smith is definitely an enlightenment thinker, but he's a complicated enlightenment thinker. And, you know, virtue ethics was not entirely alien to him. Some people have referred to him as the last of the virtue ethics. That might be pushing it a bit too far, but certainly, you know, S Smith was a a compelling moral philosopher uh, in his own in his own right. Okay. Eleven. Let me. Okay. Let me um, stop share. Okay. That's um, okay. I'm back. Uh, I can see you all. Um, let's, so I, um, that was, um, that was the lecture. Uh, it was an hour and a quarter. I got through most of what I wanted to get through. As I said, you can, you can get, um, a lot of what I talked about is in the chapter of Cathonomics. I would also recommend reading David Wooten. Uh, I will put Professor Pearson and Professor, um, uh, Dirks Meyers, uh, little essay on Aristotle and business ethics in the chat, uh, sorry, in the blackboard. Um, but um, let's, um, I am now uh, happy to have it take questions if you like. I remember I told you all that I'm willing to stay for office hours until noon. Um, if you want to stay and ask me questions or have a chat, that's fine. If you don't, because this is week one and you need to sift through this material and think about it, that's fine too. You can always send me an email and we can talk bilaterally. I'm, I'm happy with that. We're a small enough group that we can keep it informal. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions uh, right now? And you, and now I, I, I'm back in the, um, I'm, I'm back in gallery view, so you can put your hand up if needed. I have a question. Um, yes, go ahead, Olivia. In the beginning of class, you were talking about like a group discussion board on Blackboard that you would be like looking at and we'd be continuing yeah. like a conversation on. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be like a required amount of posts a week or is it just kind of do as you no. do? 
it's do as you do. No, there's going to you know that there's going to be no um, you're not going to be evaluated based on the amount of postings you do on the thing. This is more because you know let's try and train ourselves to be. Um, one of the goals of the course was to kind of train ourselves in how to be and how to inculcate a kind of a virtue ethics among economic as as economic decision makers, and part of that involves deliberation. So let's try and deliberate among ourselves. Let's debate the issues. Uh, I would love to see a robust debate among the students going back and forth. Uh, you can use it to ask questions of me or Professor Sachs, but you can also just use it to debate among yourselves. But it's entirely up to you. There's no requirement to do this in the course. It's just we thought it would be a neat thing to put there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, in that case, let's end the class. I'll, I'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody wants to ask me questions one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. um, uh, that's fine too. Uh, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. Otherwise, you have my email, it's on the blackboard. You know how to find me. So thank you all very much. Uh, I very much enjoyed talking about subjects that are close to my heart. And we'll see you next week. Professor Sachs will see you on Tuesday and I will see you on Friday. Uh, have a wonderful weekend, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Hi, Professor. I wanted to quickly ask you um, if we're, is there any chance that we're covering niche in this semester? specifically with the slave and master morality. That's something I covered last semester. And I thought that that would be extremely applicable. It would. Um, I don't think he's not, Nietzsche is not on the syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. We can ask, um, maybe Jesse, we can ask uh, Professor Sachs if he, if, if he plans on, 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 on talking about Nietzsche. I don't uh, in my sections, but maybe, uh, but I agree with you in a sense that this enlightenment, um, shift towards the, uh, the, 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 it really reaches its apotheosis in Nietzsche. Uh, it really, you know, how every, you know, where it, where this can lead. I mean, I don't want to knock the enlightenment. You have wonderful thinkers like Immanuel Kant. Right. But you also have Nietzsche, who I think leads to a very dangerous, uh, dangerous morality. Uh, but let's, um, let me check on that and see if Professor Sachs plans to mention Nietzsche. Uh, yeah. I thought especially related to like Christian, to Christian morality. I think, uh, I mean, yes. personally, when I was reading about it and studying it, I thought it was extremely intriguing and, you know, something that we should definitely talk about within, you know, the Christian church. Um, but I was just curious if we were going to cover it this semester. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I am not, but uh, okay. maybe, maybe Professor Sachs will, we'll find out for you there, but that's a very good point. Um, we, we, we talk, we'd be mentioning Ayn Rand, who I think is a Nietzschean, but yes, yeah. All right, and, thank you. Um, if I may, it, you could also feel free to raise questions and points about Nietzsche on the discussion board too. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for, thank you, Juliana, for raising that. That's a, uh, Yes, a very powerful thinker. Uh, Alexi. I think James had his hand up for me. Oh, sorry, James. Oh. Uh, Alexi, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff, uh, Anthony, thank you very much. I'm kind of blown away. Um, our, um, this is supposed to be a, a rough draft course that you're just starting for the first time and groping away. It's the level of polish so far is quite astounding. Oh, thank you. I sent you a note saying, um, I thought this course should be the first course for anybody getting a PhD in economics. Um, Completely agree. The way we were taught economics is, uh, is, 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 is very defective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you may know, Barbara and I have a lot of background in economics and her PhD is from MIT in economics. Um, oh, that's the best. Are you, all, are you all in touch with other economics departments that, um, that, could listen to what you're saying? Not really. Really, Fordham is really where we are at the moment. Yeah, the, a lot. I mean, it, I think it's hard enough getting Catholic economics departments to focus on this. 
getting non-Catholic economics departments is a very, very difficult task. Uh, but, you know, but there is, um, there's a sea change going on, um, you know, with there. I think there's a lot of, I think it's been, a lot of it is driven by students. I think there's a demand for students for, and the way they phrase it is they don't, they want a more um, pluralistic vision of economics that uh, looks at different traditions, not just the neoclassical tradition. Um, we're, we're doing a little, something a little bit different. We're not, fo we're not giving you the economic pluralism. We're trying, we're trying to argue that this kind of new virtue ethics rooted in Aristotelian phrenesis is, is better than rational choice. And it can help you, you know, analyze uh, the problems we face in the world today. Yeah. But I think, but there's a huge change, but I, you, Jim, you might have ideas as to how to um, roll this out in a more uh, widespread, but I think for now, we're happy with our little Fordham group. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. I want to thank Alexi for getting my readings to us and getting us on Blackboard. And yes. apologize for not asking Jesse to do that. I just, <laughs> but Alexi came to, to our rescue right away and we're all in great shape. This yes, is thank you, Alexi. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Alexi, you, you, you have a question first, so why don't you ask it? I have a, actually a question for you when you finish. Okay, um, so my question was concerning the idea of um, need, uh, need fulfillment. I mean, I know um, that's something that, uh, you know, you talk about in your intro economics courses a lot uh, when you talk about the market, the reason for why the market exists, right? It, it um, allocates scarce re resources for the mm -hmm. fulfillment of needs. Um, and that idea of needs came up um, many times now when we're talking about um, Aristotle, for example, to um, like you need to have certain basic needs fulfilled in order to reach um, happiness. Um, and uh, the entire sort of focus on um, so uh, helping the poor first and foremost uh, also has something to do with basic needs. So I just, I was just thinking about, uh, I was just wondering if you can talk about that a little bit more, like the, the idea of need fulfillment, like this the formalization of humans have yeah. certain needs that need to be fulfilled. What's the best way to do that? Um, and the market being well, one answer to that. I think that, you know, in a sense, uh, Alexi, you're jumping ahead because we're going to be talking a lot about these kinds of subjects when we talk about poverty and sustainability. Um, because, you know, the whole course title is Sustainable and Inclusive Planet. But I think um, one argument that we would make is that, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, encapsulate the kind of the, the basic needs of humanity. You know, no poverty, no hunger education, health, food, um, clean energy, sustainable consumption and production. I think the SDGs do a pretty good job of laying out uh, the needs of humanity. And, and they would form, I would argue that that would form the basis of a kind of an Aristotelian human flourishing because to be a, for, to be a eudaimon, you need you need basic stuff. You need to be free of poverty. You need to be free of discrimination. You need basic, uh, the basic goods. Um, but, uh, but you also need things outside the material sphere. You need, you need culture. You need religion. You need relations. You need friends. You need uh, nature. Uh, all this stuff to be fully fulfilled human beings. So economics can only take you so far. But I think it, 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 I think it can provide the material basis of human flourishing. And certainly when we get to later parts of the course, uh, this is definitely an argument that you are going to, you're going to hear over and over again. In a sense, um, Professor Sachs's professional career has been to make the moral case for alleviating global poverty and deprivation. And this is the moral case. We are, what we're doing right now is we are building the moral case from the bottom up. So my answer to your question is stay tuned. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that. Okay, thank you. Tony, that reminds me, could also eventually, and we could talk to Owen about this, bring in some questions about like the, 
world happiness report agenda and kind of the questions yeah. of asking people about their you know the subjective well-being questions versus the capabilities approach that could be an interesting item for debate yep definitely Definitely. Maybe we should do a cantor ladder among the students and ask, actually ask them, what's your life satisfaction? But that might be a little personal. I don't know. No, I, I actually think that would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe on the, on the, on week 11, when we talk about um, subjective well-being, we can ask the students to actually assess their own well-being and to see how it stacks up with the U S average and things like that. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. We can do that, but but yeah, but the, the the World Happiness Report, as you know, Jesse, from the syllabus, the, there's a lot of material there. We're going to be talking about that a lot. Yeah, Professor Annette, thank you so much for this course. It's I've been searching for this course for a really long time, so I oh. thank you and Dr. Sachs for putting it together. Really wonderful. I was struck by when you were talking about wealth and Aristotle, and I'm not going to say it right, but chromat. Crematistic. Yeah. Blame Michael. <laughs> blame Michael Pearson for that. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. There was um. There was a. There was an article in the Guardian just yesterday. It's an opinion piece in the Guardian. It's called "The Regime That Enabled Amazon's Monopoly Finally Begins to Crumble," and and it's this idea that that all of these all of these great robber barons of our age today. Um, they exist because because we've empowered them, not because they're anything special in and of themselves. Um, and I just it just struck me when that came up. Yeah. My question, um, and I guess it's to Alexi and Jesse, um, Professor Stoner, myself, and Barbara aren't on Blackboard um, because we're not um, matriculated in the Fordham system. Is there a workaround um, or is there something we should do? What's the best way to deal with that? Um, I thought Alexi already did that. Alexi, do you want to respond first? I don't yeah, know. yeah. I added, I added them to Blackboard. Barbara, I couldn't add yet because I didn't have her Fordham email. But I think what James is saying is that they don't even have access to Blackboard. So even if they added to the course, they couldn't access the material. So whether there's another way. What? Professor Stoner, you may still have access as a result of... Um, Best of my knowledge, I have complete access to the course through Blackboard. Why don't you and I, when we get done, why yeah. don't you and I see if we can access you on your Blackboard? And, um, and if that's the case, then we'll just use your login. Barbara and I can both use your login to get in there. Well, I can... uh, and that may be a good workaround so that we have access to all the course yeah. materials. We'll get, back, we'll get back to Jesse and uh, Alexi and tell us where we stand. Jesse, you were about to say something? Um, I was just going to say, yeah, I'm actually still waiting on access to Blackboard. Um, Tony helped to file some sort of basically external access release form for me to get access to Fordham yeah. System. Yeah, if that's just to interrupt you, Jesse, that's, that's now with HR. I don't, maybe Alexi knows more than what I do about the Fordham System, but uh, it's with HR and I don't know what they're doing with it or how long it's going to take, but yeah, that's what we're, we're, we're um, waiting. But otherwise, um, the only alternative I think, which would give you access to everything except for the discussion board is we have a, a big fat Dropbox folder, which we're using to collect all the materials and readings. So I don't know if that would be appropriate to share on your end, but that could be something, an easy way. I, to give you access to the readings or the PDFs, the syllabus, et cetera. Why don't, we see, why don't Professor Stoner and I see whether we can access it a different way? And if we run into roadblocks all along, then maybe we'll go down that road and Perfect. we'll let you know what we find out. Great. Sounds good. Uh, maybe you could also talk to Barbara at the same time because I'm still waiting for her, her email so that she's updated on this whole uh, conversation because it, I, I take it that she also wants the material just like you do. I, I live with Barbara and I recommend patients for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Barbara is Professor Stoner's wife. So. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But, yeah, I guess, Jeff, we'll talk about this way down the road and multiple times, but um, um, 
James is looking for a PhD program in the right place. And obviously this course is the right course for him. Wow. Um, down the road, let's talk about it. Whether or not Fordham or Columbia might want to start being about developing a PhD program that's appropriate for this century and not for the last century. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. It's amazing. I've done a search both here and in Europe. Um, I spent quite a lot of time living in Europe. And there is, there really, there are some that have tacked it on, but I think the best summation was last summer during the IAJBS, the Jesuit Business School, um, uh, the virtual conference in Guadalajara. We had um, a conference of economists from departments all across the world. And to a man, they all, well, you were on the call. You and Jeff Sachs led the call. And at the end of it, to a person, everyone said, it's not economics if we're not teaching neoclassical economic I, models. I remember that in the small group I was leading in this network too, I also had the same reaction from some of the economists. If, if you don't teach elasticities, it's no longer economics. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The, the idea that economic thought can no longer grow, change, or develop. Yeah. Because it's now yeah. set in stone and everybody agrees on it. Yes. Yes. It's, uh... We have many weeks of adventure ahead of us. We do. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you. And thank you both for sitting in. I, yeah, it's great. Uh, anything else before I uh, need to run and use the bathroom? <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to end the meeting then. Thank you very right. much. Uh, see you next week. Okay. Take care. Jesse, right. Alexi, you know how to reach me if you have any. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. See you. Bye-bye. James, I'll call you on FaceTime. Bye-bye. <laughs>